Okay, so, so far what I've been talking is mostly contrasting two views, what I call the gatekeeper view and the phenomenal field view, two views of consciousness, and I've tried to articulate the difference between these two views. Obviously, as you can see, most of my explanation have been here, because this is a view that I am interested in developing, but I mentioned how this view is different from that view, and the difference is that in that view, consciousness is limited by whatever attention can process. So, in that view, consciousness is whatever I am conscious to in the sense of what I am attending to, right? And that's a view that I have called the gatekeeper view, and I have told, uh, said that this is a view which is dominant in the field of cognitive science, right? Remember, at any time, if you have a question about what I'm talking about, don't hesitate to raise your hand, because this is, in a way, the best way that you will get anything from me is to ask a question. But if there is no question, I will proceed and contrast this view with that view, which is that, no, the common basis is obviously perceptual processing, the inputs that come from all the various senses, no difference there. The difference is whether we think of consciousness as being exclusively what we attend to, or whether we think of consciousness having what I have called an overflow, right? Meaning there is more to consciousness than what we can strictly attend to, right? That's a view that I have developed here, and that's a view which is in uh, sympathy or which is commensurate with our common sense understanding of consciousness, mind, and so on. This is how we probably normally think about consciousness, that is, as being wider than uh, what we can attend to. There is more in consciousness than what I can attend to. And one of the ways to understand more is this difference between foreground and background, attention being not just this narrow kind of spotlight that focus on a particular object, but me being much more the way in which attention structure the field of consciousness in terms of foreground and background, right? For example, when I see an object, my attention is in a way focused on that object, but it's not just focus on that object, but it's because it includes the background against which I am seeing the object, right? And so, Conscious, in that view, consciousness is more than what we can attend to, because consciousness has this foreground, background structure, right? Can you give a real-life example? Well, the real-life example is vision, when I see something, a person... For example? Yeah, I see that person against the background, right? And that background is part of my conscious experience, but is not what I am attending directly, right? Similarly, when uh, I attend a, a, a visual object, a person, for example, I look at a person, there are other sensory stimuli that are coming to me. Some are completely below the threshold of consciousness, but some, I would argue, are not. There is sound that is coming to me, there is various sensations in my body, there is maybe a taste in my mouth. Now, if I'm extremely concentrated on uh, what I'm looking at, I might not be conscious of any at all, but I think in normal experience, where our degree of focus is limited, our consciousness is a kind of openness, which allows all kinds of stimuli to come in and be part of my conscious experience without really being attended, right? For example, as I was looking to Alex, 
I was hearing the sound of uh, the air conditioning. Now, it was part of my experience, but I wasn't attending to that until I turned my attention to that sound, right? So that's what I call the phenomenal model of the phenomenal field view of consciousness. Yeah. I'm going to talk about dreaming and, and the whole consciousness and how it's distinguished. I d I, I'm not sure exactly where you want to go. Oh, yeah. I, I, okay, so if consciousness is not just what we can attend to, uh, what should we, how should we think about dreaming, right? That dreaming would then be part of it. And, and yes. Would this claim, of course, that dreaming is part of the part of Yes. Uh, yeah, as I, I briefly touched about uh, this topic. There is two, in a way, there are two distinctions here. One is the distinction between, for example, foreground and background. That's come from Gestalt, but that's one way, that's one kind of distinction which is uh, important to keep in mind. Every kind of object in consciousness comes against a background, right? And so the, the consciousness is including a lot more than the object which is just the foreground. So that's one kind of distinction. The other kind of distinction is what you would, could call states of consciousness, right? Uh, up to a few years ago, many people were saying consciousness starts when you wake up, right? No, consciousness doesn't start when you wake up. It starts with your coffee. <laughs> For some people, <laughs> I drink tea these days. Uh, so, uh, consciousness, it's an example, obviously, of consciousness, but it doesn't start uh, when you wake up, right? Dream is clearly a mode of experience. And nowadays, even people have started to come around the idea of lucid dreaming, though it's still not really that well explored. Everybody knows lucid dreaming, where you're aware that you're dreaming, right? So dreams start to become better studied by cognitive science. Uh, it's still a debate, hotly debated issue, whether it's uh, we can think about experience in deep sleep or not. And that's still on the table. Uh, so there are many states of consciousness. There is also states of consciousness like hypnosis and so on. So we can think about consciousness as in being in different states, right? So that's one kind of consideration. The other kind of consideration is the distinction between foreground and background, right? So this is a view that I have defended, and in that view, we make a distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. So access consciousness is the object we are directly attending to. In my example, Alex. Phenomenal consciousness, or consciousness that directly uh, apprehend the person I'm looking at to, <coughs> that's access consciousness. Phenomenal consciousness is the whole, the entirety of my experience at that moment, right? And according to that view, there is more in the phenomenal consciousness than there is in the access consciousness, right? That's a standard terms that are used by people in cognitive science and phenomenal, well, not phenomenal, cognitive science and philosophy of mind. Okay? Can I, can I raise a concrete example? Yes, please. For this kind of thing, there's some nice research done on uh, people doing interviews, or job interviews. And there were fake interviews and fake applicants, but the 
applicants would come in with a resume, have a 10 minute interview and leave, and then they would be scored by the interviewer on different things. Mm -hmm. And the variable factor in it was the weight of the resume. And it turned out that people that went in with the heavier resumes were scored higher for reliability. <laughs> the people that went in with colored resumes, yellow and pink and nice colors, male or female, were scored higher for sociability. So the weight of the resume is something that <coughs> the interviewer has no idea that they that they mm -hmm. have measured it, mm -hmm. no idea that's affecting their judgment. But it obviously has gone into their field of consciousness. That's right. It has affected their behavior, even though they have no have not paid attention to it. Okay. Now. People have asked me last time, what's the arguments on this side, right? And I say, well, you need to invite my friends, but uh, uh, maybe I should say a few words. One of the debates that I have with my friend is whether your example is an example of something which is in consciousness and is not noticed, or is below the threshold of consciousness and nevertheless influence my uh, judgment, right? That's a question that uh, my friend would raise. What is the sign that it is in consciousness rather than just influencing consciousness, though not being in consciousness, meaning being below the threshold of consciousness, right? That's a question. For example, uh, deep priming is supposed to be an example of an influence that people un is, remains below the level of consciousness. If you, if you uh, ask to, I think it's judging faces, right? The experiment is you judge faces, but at the same time, you, uh, certain words are spoken to you, right? And Depending on the words that you have spoken to you, you can see that these words have an, ex an influence on uh, what you, how you, the judgment that you make, right? And the question is whether this is really in consciousness or whether it is actually below the threshold of consciousness and uh, uh, just kind of retrojectively uh, attributed to consciousness, right? So that's one kind of question. Can you give you an example, an example of that? Yeah. There's an experiment done where the people go into the room and they're given a word game and they have to arrange certain words out of this word game. And then when they left the room, they had to walk down a corridor and the psychologist measured how much time it took to walk down the corridor. So when the words that were given in the word game that you have to work out are things like spring or lively or bright, you would walk faster down the corridor afterwards. Mm -hmm. And when there were words like old or senile or decrepit, <laughs> yes. then you would walk slower down the corridor, even though you have no intention of changing the speed that you walk at. Exactly. So, that was a deep priming. They're priming you with these words, and it's affecting your action without you even knowing it. Yeah, and in that case, it's clear that it's not in consciousness, right? Or well, no, maybe it's not clear. I shouldn't say that. It but on you, right? yeah, it's arguably that it's below the threshold of consciousness and influence the behavior rather than something that is in consciousness. My usual example of something that is in consciousness influence, that is in consciousness, but not uh, in, uh, uh, in the focus of attention is also what I call inattentive cognition. When you're talking to a friend and then some, uh, or a person, and then some other friend comes and suddenly uh, the person keeps talking to you and your attention is drawn by the new person, uh, I would say at this point, the words that my friend is talking, my first friend is speaking to me, I in consciousness, because you kind of can recollect that your 
first friend was speaking, but you may not understand it because you're not focused, you're focused somewhere else. So that for me is an example of what I call the overflow of consciousness. But as you can see, there are arguments to be made. Uh, so what you seem to be describing is a broader consciousness that yes. you're talking about. Is the, is the kind of capacity to be affected, whether we're, we're attending to it or we're and, right, the capacity to be affected yeah. by the world. So, when we were confused, that, so let's say I have a, a bacteria in my stomach, yeah. and the bacteria yeah. around okay. stomach, at what point does it enter yes. like consciousness, yes. not potential consciousness, but like... No, no. Exactly, absolutely. So, question is, uh, I'm talking about consciousness as the entirety of the experience, and I am uh, talking about how stimuli, which may not be in the focus of attention, may influence us. So, does it mean that everything influences is part of consciousness? Well, that's a good question. I would say no. But then you would ask me, what's your criteria? for distinguish what is in consciousness and what's below the threshold of consciousness, but nevertheless causally influence my experience, right? My answer would be what I can recall. Now, there are two candidates. One is recalled, recall, one is forced choice, okay? So, for example, recall. Uh, when I was talking to Will and somebody else drew my attention, uh, I totally lost track of what Will was saying, but I can recall that he was speaking to me. So this is a sign that Will's words were in my consciousness, though they were not really attended to, right? Now, take this other uh, case, blind sight. Remember, uh, some people after a stroke are affected by this condition in which they claim to be blind, and there is all reason to believe that in a way they are blind, but when you force them to make choices about the object they are presented with, they deal with these choices quite successfully at about 80% uh, level. So, for example, if you present them with large patch of colors and tell them guess which colors are in front of you, they will guess right at more than 80%. So it's way above chance. When also, if you ask them to navigate a, a labyrinth which is not too uh, complicated, they will manage quite fine. This condition is called blind sight. Maybe we should write priming blind sight. This also reminds me of the whole phantom limb phenomenon. Yes. So, in blind sight, you don't have recall, right? It's an example of forced choice, right? Is that a good criteria for what is in consciousness or not? Okay, that's the two criteria which I usually use to distinguish what is in consciousness, but so you're at three level, right? You have what is fully attended to, you have what is not attended to, but what, that's my chair. What is in consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> Just a second. So you have three level, you have what is fully attended to, you have what is not fully attended to, but is in consciousness, and what you have is completely below the threshold of consciousness, right? So, where do you draw the line? And two criteria possible, I would suggest, is either forced choice or recall, right? Yes? I might mention some of the research into this idea, which was popular a few years ago, but the question arises, when you come here and you're not sure if you turn the gas off in your apartment and you go back and you find that you did turn the gas off. Now the question is, you can't recall, that's my chair. I know. <laughs> the question is, you can't recall whether you turned the gas off. 
But we don't know whether while you were turning the gas off, you were conscious of it or not. <laughs> okay. It may have been an automatic action yeah. that didn't get into consciousness, but it may have been conscious. Yes. But just because we can't recall it doesn't mean it wasn't in consciousness. Exactly. So this is two criteria that we can think about for distinguish what is completely below the threshold of consciousness and what is conscious but not fully attended to. Like, for example, I will talk about that next time, but sometime when I drive, it's like, yeah, you're not fully conscious, right? Yeah, well, the Sartre example was like, you're engrossed in the book, you don't remember reading it, and someone asks you what you did, and you're like, oh, I was reading a book. Yeah. You know you didn't recall it, but you have a pre-awareness of it actually happening. Yeah. Uh, this man's uh, question was interesting because he brought up two, two things for me. The first is that we can train ourselves to be conscious of things that other people wouldn't be. And yes. Then, and then secondly, this is very technical and good, but in fact, don't we just rely on people's articulation to believe that they're conscious? I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, someone who is a health practitioner for me does a lot of health things. And he says to me, so when I did this, I could feel that my liver was relaxing and it was opening up. And I was thinking, yeah. wow, he's aware of things that I am not only distantly aware of, but, but I trust his words that he is conscious of that. Yes, sure. I'm just thinking pragmatically, we rely on those kind of reports. Uh, yes, but that doesn't uh, forestall this kind of dis distinction, no, no. right? Yeah. But you're right, a lot of things that we think we are conscious to actually we, we get to because of other people. That's absolutely right. But still, we can, it's, we're trying to kind of get as close down as possible. Yeah? I, yeah, the yeah. idea of the here brought up a good topic for me. How this question for me. You know how the neuroscientists are now claiming, for example, this point is that the level of blood bacteria, friendly probiotic bacteria, has a direct yes. brain yes. and states of yes. Yes. mental health. Yes. So the question then is, you know, what role it does, where does consciousness come in? Yeah. In all, well, and, you know, because now we're talking about a different kind of phenomenon, right? So, that's really the question. Yeah, yeah. That, no, there is... Certainly not an attentional consciousness here. No. I don't think it's a phenomenal consciousness either, but the question is where you draw the line is a real question, and these are two of the ways I would suggest we, we draw the line, right? Now, so you start to see the kind of debate that I have with my friend. It's also the main argument for this view is actually uh, an argument that I really am not very sympathetic to, but which is really important, which is, if you go for this view, you're going to have a hard time to build a model of consciousness, because you have this kind of woozy stuff, which is phenomenal consciousness, which is kind of holistic, but it's vague, it has no, it's not bounded, and so this kind of I wouldn't call an entity, but because it's not an entity. But this kind of understanding of consciousness is very difficult to operationalize in terms of cognitive science. Whereas this model is much more uh, prone to be operationalized in, in uh, uh, cognitive science by using computational model, right? So nowadays, the dominant view is this view, maybe not because, whether it's true or not, it certainly is the case that this view lends itself to a computational approach. And the advantage of a computational approach is that you have models, right? You can model cognitive functions in the computer. And that's very powerful way to understand the human mind. My claim is that it's not going to do the job entirely, but it is important to recognize that, especially with the new level of artificial intelligence, that 
computational approach uh, approaches are extremely powerful. Well, to make money, but also to, well, for example, uh, recently the Go program, right, was a fantastic achievement in terms of intelli artificial intelligence. Now we are far from the kind of general purpose artificial intelligence that pioneers dreamed of in the 50s and 60s, but it is clear that we have made uh, enormous progress and that this computational model are very powerful. And so when you adopt this model, you give yourself ways to understand uh, consciousness at a level in which you can build model with actual predictions. Where this kind of uh, approach, obviously, uh, it's going to, it looks, it's going to be much harder to operationalize in terms of uh, a, a kind of, um, the kind of tool that com uh, uh, cognitive science uses. One of the particularity of, of uh, cognitive science is that the, the classical model of, uh, of standard scientific approach is you have a function and then you explain the function through a lower level mechanism, right? Maybe you want to write this, function and lower level mechanism. <coughs> now, if, sorry, if we were doing this, uh, if we were really what we should be looking for is cognitive function, and the lower level mechanism in the brain, right? That's what you would expect. That's what the standard model of scientific research leads us to believe, right? The problem, obviously, is that we don't have access very much to the brain, right? The brain is an extremely complex organism, and we don't have our tools to get to the brain are still extremely crude. So cognitive science is this approach which says, okay, we don't need to look at what the brain, the brain does. All what we need to look at is cognitive functions, and then we need to be able to model them co computationally, right? And so that's a standard approach in cognitive science, and that's why this gatekeeper view is in a very, very uh, popular because it lends itself very well to a computational model. What it doesn't do very well is uh, be able to provide an explanation for this overflow in consciousness, right? The fact that we're not just attending object kind of an uh, digitally, but that we are attending that we are part of an entire situation of which we are partly conscious, and that, that within this background, within this horizon, we are attending a particular object, right? So that's kind of holistic dimension, that's horizon of consciousness, that's something that this model has a really hard time explaining. What it does well is talking about how we attend to the particular object, and then you will have to say, well, the horizon is just something we fill in or that we project retrospectively. Uh, I don't think it does a very good job about that. So that gives you an idea of the argument that goes support that first view. Sorry. So, um, another first view is more like kind of. Eh? Away. Yes, okay. So the question is whether we can think computationally about access consciousness and try to think differently about phenomenal consciousness, right? So you, have, you still have the two views. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the answer obviously is we don't know, right? One of the consequences that you should draw from my little talk about how cognitive uh, science proceeds is that it builds models of different cognitive function. Now, 
to which extent these models are implemented in the brain? That we don't know. Because to quote a fam famous sentence, map is not a territory, right? So the model just tells you what goes in, what comes out, and it tells you the mechanism uh, that contribute to this process, but it's not sure that this is what's happening in the brain, right? And the main reason we don't know whether the brain computes or not, in my, according to my opinion, is that we don't know how the brain handles memory. So as long as we don't know how the brain handles memory, all what we are doing, and it's already a lot, is modeling. Now, modeling is already pretty good. Here, I would say we're not doing modeling, we're doing metaphors. So there is a real difference between metaphors and modeling and the actual mechanism that create the function that you are studying because you might be able to provide a good model, but actually the brain might do it differently, right? So the answer, I think, in short is we don't really know yet. But what is important is that you understand the power of this approach, which is enormous and is taking a lot of our life uh, over. And I think one distinction that I like to make uh, to kind of clarify things is that in many, many discussions, people confuse consciousness and intelligence. I am not talking about intelligence. What do I mean by intelligence? Problem-solving ability. Problem-solving ability? Okay, computer definitely can have problem-solving ability. The Go program that defeated the world master in Go was a fantastic program. It's basically a bunch of algorithms and then you set the the computer, the program to learn uh, the game of Go, it about played with itself about a million games, and out of a million games it learned how to play Go. Real problem-solving ability, real learning, no question. But what I'm talking about is consciousness, not intelligence. That's a distinction that I like to be. Now, obviously, Maybe in the long run, we'll see that actually consciousness boils down to intelligence, but I strongly doubt it, because when you think about consciousness in animals, you realize that it's probably not working like a computer, that uh, the kind of mechanisms that are involved to create consciousness are not computing mechanisms, though they may do some computation, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can pursue and then, yeah. What about plants and sunlight? That I don't know. So much yeah, that I don't know. Uh, there is a whole discussion nowadays whether plants have consciousness and so on. Uh, have seen documentaries about <laughs> is it ethical to eat yeah, yeah, yeah. As you know, in ancient India, uh, there, were, there was a debate between Jains and Buddhists. Uh, Buddhists argues that plants don't have sentience, because this is really the sign of consciousness is sentience, right? We distinguish sentience from intelligence, right? So uh, sentience is what is characteristic of, pe of being with consciousness versus intelligence, right? So the debate in India was whether plants were sentient or not, and the Buddhists argue that they were not, and the Jains argue that they were. Okay? Now, when we, I talk about this, I, I, when I think about this, I think an easy way to try to draw the, the boundary is the central nervous system, right? Whether the organism has a central nervous system or not. That, to me, strikes me as a relatively good way to handle the problem, but who knows whether this is the right way, right? The reason it's a good way is that uh, people often uh, in, ask this question, why do we have consciousness, right? That's a question which is often asked, and that, I think, to me, is a ridiculous question. Uh, 
it's a ridiculous question because it's obvious that uh, we have to understand consciousness as a product of evolutionary development, right? So we have to understand consciousness within the context of how consciousness helps uh, organism to survive and to reproduce. No, to me, anything else is just like, no. That's the basis to understand the role of consciousness. And so when you look at the evolution, what you understand is when more and more complex organisms evolve, these organisms need to have ways to uh, coordinate their different functions and actions, right? And to com have ways for the different parts that make them to communicate. And so it's pretty clear that there is a good reason why we have consciousness. Obviously, it doesn't tell us how we have consciousness, just why we have consciousness, right? And so why we have consciousness is for coordination and for communication so that we can coordinate the different uh, parts of our organism, right? Which a zombie presumably could not do. So, I'm um, sorry, but I mean, that, that's actually part of the broad definition. If you talk about coordinating aspects, so like, of course, we think about humans, we can understand how humans yes. coordinate the world, and consciousness is very complex, but even in very low level organisms, too, they're also coordinating with the world they're kind of being affected by. That question. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, I mean, You're yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure that, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, yeah, I mean, I think. That functional argument for consciousness as being something that allows for coordination. Yes. Is fine with me, but I mean that also means that they can be spread across all many, 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 many different organisms across the entire animal kingdom. Yes. And so on and so forth, right? That's right. So coordination might be necessary might be a necessary condition, but not sufficient condition for consciousness, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I agree. This argument about coordination comes from a great book which I really advise, which is a fun book called Other Minds, which is about the mind of octopus. Uh, and it makes this argument really well because octopus is a very different kind of uh, being that we are, right? It's, uh, it's called Other Minds. Uh, and there the author makes a really good argument, but yes, it's very different, but in a way we can see that uh, consciousness plays this role of being able to coordinate action, right? And to communicate between the different parts of the octopus body, because the octopus body, yeah, and has consciousness in all these different tentacles, right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of really interesting. Sorry, you wanted to... Changing topics, talking about the computation model. I read recently, or I heard Richard Davidson say, question. Yes. That despite the sophisticated computation models they have for fMRIs, and they can look at the lower function of the brain, he said, at best, it's correlations. At best, it's yes. And that to this day, they cannot offer any causal explanation. Mm -hmm. So, is that because he's actually studying consciousness and not just a problem-solving kind of level of consciousness uh, or, or problem-solving aspect of the brain? Because, you know, you're looking at mindfulness and meditation. Yes. It's much broader than just e okay. the view of consciousness. So e I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah. Uh, up to 20 years ago... What, what was the question? Well, the question is, okay, how I shall summarize the question? The question is, what kind of explanation can we get with the present tools of uh, brain science in opposition to what is done in cognitive science, right? Yeah. Okay, and the answer is, there is a huge difference. That's why people do cognitive science, because we know very little about how to connect particular functions to mechanisms in the brain. We have this uh, kind of brain anatomy, well, which is now quite good, with the fMRI. Uh, apparently, there are about up to a thousand areas in the brain. But say, seeing that the brain's 
a, a, a zone of the brain is activated gives us some information, but it's obviously not an explanation of why we have this particular cognitive function, right? Why is it that we're hearing in particular way? Well, because this area is activated. No, sorry, that's not a full explanation. But the beginning of an explanation tells us where we are going to have to look, but it's still a long way for providing an explanation. So what do people do? In the absence of a sufficient uh, brain science, what they do is they do cognitive science where they can model how we hear sound, right? And that's very powerful, but that obviously doesn't necessarily tell us what is going on in the brain. So, we have our two models, right? And I want to talk, obviously, more about the second model, and I want to talk about the second model uh, in terms also of what Buddhism has to offer. So, what we have done last time is try to think about how we can describe this phenomenal aspect of consciousness, right? So I want to emphasize the word describe, which is different from the word explain, right? Phenomenology is a description of experience, of how objects are given to us in experience, it's not an explanation, right? Because an explanation would involve either causal or probabilistic mechanism, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how do we describe this experience? And what we understood last time is that what may be interesting is to provide uh, kind of properties or characteristic of consciousness that are generalizable across a lot of different types of experience, right? And that's why I talked about putative candidates for invariant features of mental states, right? Uh, how did we summarize that? P experience, you said. Of experience, okay. Uh, p PC. Oh, PCIS, right? PCIS, so PCIE, PCIE. Yeah, okay. So, last time we came up with two invariants, right? Well, one, uh, two main, okay. three. Okay, why don't I take a little exam? What are the features that we came up with? What's that? Number one, intentionality. I'm going to collapse it into intentionality. And then? Purpose perspectivalism. That's going to be part of it. Yes, yeah, slash holism. Ownership. Okay, so these are the two most important ones. We need to think about... Uh, Intentionality, uh, which uh, is or object orientation, as well as sense making, right? I talked about how consciousness is a way, uh, is a way for us to make sense, both at the reflective level in which we might use language, stories, and so on, but also at the pre-reflective level where we experience a world and my example was uh, walking, right? When we see a person move across the room, we understand that person is moving rather than that person occupying different areas in space, which is motion anosognosia is a condition in which people don't see movement. They see just position, they see this person at position one, two, three, and so on, but they don't see movement. Why? Because part of their brain has been damaged and they cannot make sense of what they're seeing, hence they see separate, uh, separate uh, positions, right? So this is a way at the pre-reflective level in which 
we make sense of the world, right? What is around us, our experience, and so on. And that's what we call intentionality, right? And one of the consequences of intentionality is this perspectival nature of consciousness, which is we understand, we make sense from the perspective that we inhabit, right? <coughs> Second is ownership, and by ownership I mean perspectival ownership, which is the fact that experience happen for I. That there is an I who is the subject of experience. This is what I call also pre-reflective self-awareness, right? So these are the two features to that we, two candidates for being invariant features of experience, right? So you can see we're trying to find characteristics that are so general as to be, enable us to uh, provide the description, obviously with the idea that this description uh, is going to be, at some point, gradually matched with some kind of third-person perspective, scientific perspective. And so this is a way maybe we can make progress on consciousness. There is obviously, obviously the possibility that we cannot understand consciousness, that consciousness is so basic to who we are that we cannot understand it. Certainly, that's what is called Mysterianism, right? And Husserl, about whom I talked last time, was a Mysterian. He always thought that because every experience presupposes consciousness, we can never understand consciousness. I personally don't know. What my thinking is, is that it's very unlikely that we will understand consciousness by using computational model. It's not impossible, but I think it's highly unlikely. But I think there, there will be other way to do science, particularly based on biology and understanding, for example, how simpler organisms like bees and flies and so on, how their brain is able to process information and create what I think is a limited but real conscious experience. So I think uh, there are going to be other ways to progress to make, uh, to understand scientific, scientifically consciousness, but obviously, uh, who knows, right? We... Oh, sorry. Yes, please. In Buddhism, they talk about consciousness as the sort of glad uh, ease. What, when the Buddha was talking about consciousness, what, what was he talking about? Well, okay, I'm yet to come to Buddhism, okay? Because we, we have experts here, and we, it would be fun to try. It's going, I think, interesting to try to think about how this phenomenology compares to Buddhist views about consciousness, right? We come to that in a week. No, no, we come now. Oh, okay. <laughs> we come now. Okay. Yeah. No, this is why I don't want to do the self, because I think there will be enough on the table. So I want to talk about that now, and I want to also talk about time consciousness, which is an important part of Husserl's uh, work, and which is a very interesting idea, which I think provides also a way to move forward scientifically. Yes? If you say that in the phenomenological view of consciousness, does intentionality include some form of movement, behavior, action, that I think very consciously suggests Okay, uh, okay. Yes, there is a question of agency. Right, agency is with a question mark. I will talk to about that next time. But there is the question whether agency is a fundamental feature of experience or not. 
My own view, it's not, but Evan Thompson, for example, thinks it is. So this is very much one of the debate. I think, uh, well, we'll talk about that today and next time, but next time I am going to talk about agency because it's obviously very important from a cognitive point of view, but also from a Buddhist point of view because consciousness and karma have a very, very close connection, right? And so from a Buddhist point of view, we need to understand what actions are. I think that's, for me, as a modern Buddhist, that's the interest of getting into this kind of stuff, is to try to understand ancient Buddhist notions in a new way, obviously uh, with a certain amount of latitude for translation, but uh, maybe not completely out of the blue either. One of the ideas in Buddhism which closely model this kind of features is uh, the model of uh, cognition or consciousness developed by Dignaga and Dharmakirti, who argues that every uh, mental state is at the same time has an object, but also has self awareness, what they call svasamviti, right? Self-reference. It's usually translated as self-cognition or self-awareness. It is a self-cognition which is what Sartre called non-positional or non-observational, right? That is, when I have an experience, I know Eo ipso that I am having that experience. So there is a kind of information which is happening, yet it's not the case that my experience is an object, right? So there is a kind of non-objectal self-awareness. Pre-reflective self-awareness is a term that phenomenologists use. And that is pretty close to what Dharma Kirti and Dignaga have in mind. Dignaga said famously, consciousness has two aspects, object apprehension and self-awareness, right? Self-cognition, which is not cognition of the self, but is awareness, non-positional, non-observational awareness that I have this experience. When I am aware of talking, I don't need to take talking as an object, I know that I am talking. This knowing is what is meant by pre-reflective self-awareness, which is a way to talk about ownership in the sense of perspectival ownership. Isn't something easy there? We have the subject and we have the object. It shouldn't have be linked to it too, because otherwise they're just independent. Okay. No, actually, we don't have. Okay. Well, the question is what's the relation between subject and object, right? What links them? Right? Yeah. Uh, this is nothing links them because they don't exist apart from a phenomenological perspective and from a Yogacara Buddhist perspective, they don't exist apart either. Let me explain that. This is why I, in a way, resisted this usual explanation of intentionality as object orientation. It's not wrong, but it's supposed, it implies that intentionality consists of the relation between a subject and an object. Right? That's not the phenomenal, phenomenologist view. That's not the Yogacara view either. The phenomenologist view is that experience comes as a whole. So it's not the case that when I see you, what I see is separate from my consciousness. Rather, it's the object pole of my experience, and I have the subject pole of my experience, which is the pre-reflective self-awareness that I am looking at you. Obviously, that doesn't make you part of my own uh, field of experience, but 
the perception that I have of you is part of my experience. This is when, why I emphasize <coughs> the first class that when I'm talking about the first person perspective, I am not talking about what is inside versus the third person perspective, what is outside. What is inside and outside can be seen from both perspectives. When I think about how I see you, I am thinking from the first person perspective. When I think about how you are there in the middle of the room as a person with a body and so on, I am thinking in the third person perspective, right? So for the phenomenologist, as well as for the Yogacara, there is no relation between subject and object, between subject and object are part of a field of experience. This is what I want to suggest with this idea of field, which is obviously a metaphor, which is that the, the experience in, is, contains the whole thing. Right? So there is the subject part and there is the object part and they're both within the field of experience. And this is explicitly argued by Husserl when he talks about the phenomenological model, something I have skipped. But it's also obviously a Yogacara view, uh, which when they argue that, uh, yeah, that basically the object that we think is internal is in fact part of our experience. Now, there is a question whether Yogacara entails idealism or not. That's a question that I am not interested here. The question, uh, I think the best way to understand Yogacara in the perspective I'm taking here is to understand Yogacara as being a phenomenology of experience that obviously does not prejudice how Asanga and Vasubandhu understood their own project. This is obviously two different questions. So for me, what I'm talking about is basically a kind of Buddha phenomenologist view or yoga charo phenomenologist view, because I think, in fact, that's what we can get out of uh, the discussion. Yeah. Let me say, I'm listening to you, that in the computational model of consciousness, if you may not accept that subject and object arise together. Oh, then, we, when. So stay away from that and just stick to the model because that's. Yeah, yeah. That's more practical, make money. Uh, we, we, we're done with that. Yeah. We, we're done with that. What we're talking is here, right? Uh, it's, that's the same thing when you look at Western mental health science, or Western, all of that, you still have that same issue. Yes, 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 yes. But what I am talking now is this model, right? What I did first is trying to respond to the question of some people, what would the other side say? And that's why I wanted to articulate what this model is doing and why it is powerful. But uh, my discussion now is entirely based into this model. Yes. Object and subject are part of an experience. Okay. Uh, I guess the question is whether the perspective I am taking entails idealism, right? Whether it entails that objects are mind made or not. Uh, so the answer here is very easy. Uh, phenomenology is not about, is not a form of metaphysics meaning it's not attempted to describe reality. It's just attempted to describe experience. So in my experience, you are not separate from my vision of you. It obviously does not mean that you are crea the creation of my own mind. Now, that question would be entirely legitimate for Yogacara, because I believe that at least some Yogacaran had this belief, which is not surprising. You have similar belief in Bishop Barclay in the West, so idealism is a very, uh, has a long pedigree in the history of philosophy, but this is not what we are doing here. Idealism is a form of metaphysic, meaning a form of 
attempt to describe how things are in reality, right? This phenomenology is not dealing with reality, it's dealing strictly and only with how things are given in experience. So I would claim, in my experience, you are part of my experience, in my experience. And so obviously, I see you from my own particular point of view, right? But you obviously have your own point of view, and in fact, the third-person perspective is something we gradually learn as, as small children, building by understanding that you have your own perspective. So we go from first to second person perspective, and then from second to third person perspective, when we're able to think about reality in abstraction from the particular perspective that we are taking, so, right? So you could have this phenomenology, this phenomenology. Phenomenological, yes. Also, be an idealist or not be an idealist. Exactly. It doesn't say anything about what there is in reality. It just gives us a description of experience, right? Now, Husserl thought that by giving us a, a description of experience, we could do metaphysics, we could get to the foundation of metaphysics. I don't believe in that at all. I take phenomenology in a very reduced way as just the attempt to describe experience. Okay? So, maybe let us think about how... So, intentionality, ownership, how does that compare to some of the Buddhist views about... And then we have this phenomenal consciousness, right? <laughs> Okay, how do we think in Buddhist term about consciousness? And I guess one of the places we look for is the good old Abhidharma, right? As being one of the places in which systematic ideas of, uh, about the mind were articulated by the Buddhist in the first place. <laughs> now, I take the Abhidharma very seriously. I love Abhidharma. Uh, obviously, I take Abhidharma probably not the same way that the people who wrote Abhidharma wrote, uh, understood it, because I don't take it as literally as they do. So I have many problems with some of the descriptions of Abhidharma, but I do think that they provide us interesting insights into a phenomenology which arguably is based or is influenced or informed by contemplation. So for me, the project here that I think is interested is not contemplative, is not to take Abhidharma as contemplative science, but to take Abhidharma as contemplative phenomenology understanding that obviously Abhidharma has its own metaphysics, uh, which is not necessarily uh, the same as its phenomenology. So I think a good way for me as a modern Buddhist to take Abhidharma is to understand it as a kind of contemplative phenomenology, right? So in Abhidharma, what are the terms that are going to help us to understand Consciousness? Well, there is a term, maybe you want to write, Vijnana, there is a term Chitta, there is a term Bhavanga Chitta, there is a term Alaya Vijnana. So these are some of the terms that I think are interesting to think about in Buddhist terms, right? It's Vijnana, but anyway, that's okay. You you palified, you palified Sanskrit, yes. But I kept Alaya as Alaya, so they Yeah, well, Alaya, it's assumed is the same in Pali, no? Probably. Um, it is the same, but the long gay is the first gay. Oh, it's Alaya. Yeah, Alaya, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Vijnana with Vijnana, I think in Vyabhidharma, is mostly taken as cognitive events, right? So we have eye consciousness, ear consciousness, and so on. So we are talking about particular cognitive events, right? So in a way, this is more about access consciousness than about phenomenal consciousness, right? Or phenomenal dimension of consciousness, right? Which I think I'm really talking about. I was going to say that. Well, uh, I think in general, I think both Theravada and, uh, and uh, Yogacara Bhidharma would agree with it, but uh, uh, I'm mostly going to talk about the Yogacara via Bhidharma Samuchaya, which allows this notion to come into the picture. I think this notion, Bhavanga, Bhavanga Chitta, is, is a bit similar to that, right? So that's the kind of correlation that I'm making. And I guess I'm arguing that if you want to find something like a phenomenal consciousness in Buddhism, uh, Vijnana in the sense of eye consciousness, ear consciousness, is not going to help that much. So maybe we should look at terms like Bhavanga Chitta and Alaya Vijnana, right? So Bhavanga Chitta is? Bhavanga Chitta is Describe as, I would describe as a zero level of subjectivity. So the plug is out. Well, it's, it's completely empty, right? There is no object, and, it's, and yet it is understood to be chitta, right? Now, I'm not a big expert on Theravada tradition, uh, I'm not a big expert on anything, actually, but uh, I know a little bit more about uh, Yogacara. And actually, the idea of Alaya Vijnana strikes me as a little bit more useful than Bhavanga Chitta, though it's, uh, they are actually relatively similar. I don't know, do they think that in deep sleep we have Bhavanga Chitta? I think so, yeah. I think when your mind has no stimulus... Yeah, happens. yes. And it does so briefly between any moment. Yeah, okay. My own view is that probably the most helpful view way is uh, notion is Alaya Vijnana, but which is understood as also the, uh, a very low level of awareness, which includes the entire body as well as all the objects that we perceive. Now, <laughs> that description, obviously, I think is, is problematic because to understand alaya vijnana in terms of object is difficult, right? Isn't, that, isn't alaya vijnana where your karma is? It's also, it's both the store consciousness, but it's also the basic, base consciousness. In Tibetan, it was translated as kunshi, which is Kunshi Namche, which is the conscious, the base consciousness. So I take it as a baseline of awareness. And so the picture that we get from Yogacara sources is that out of this baseline, which is relatively similar to uh, the Bhavanga Chitta, but out of this baseline of consciousness emerge various cognitive events. In your word, they kind of pop out, right? Well, it's not my word, but... Yeah, it's a good word. And Treisman's word. Okay, okay. <laughs> so here we have a notion which I think is a little bit similar to uh, uh, phenomenal consciousness in the sense that we have a notion of consciousness which is not specific cognitive event, right? Which is a kind of background that is required for consciousness to 
arise and which is present while cognitive, specific cognitive events take shape. One of the interesting uh, uh, ideas about Alaya Vijnana is that it pervades the body. And I like that very much because I think the best uh, illustration of the phenomenologist view of consciousness is what I talked last time as being proprioceptive awareness. Remember? The body not understood as an object, but understood from the inside. We have a, a kind of diffuse awareness of our entire body, right, usually. Not always, I might be so absorbed into an object that I kind of completely forget everything about my body, but in most cases, I am quite aware of my body, where my body is, though I don't pay attention to it, right? That's what we call proprioceptive awareness. And last time I gave you the example of Jan Waterman, who is this very unfortunate person who had uh, a, a cardiovascular event, and out of this cardiovascular event, he lost all proprioceptive awareness down from the eye downward, right? And so uh, what I described last time is how Ian Waterman to walk would not be able to walk like a normal person like this, but would have to watch, to look at his feet and watch his feet moving to be able to move. And the reason he's not that is that he has lost proprioceptive awareness. He's not lost sensation. He has a sensation in his body, in his feet, the feet touching the ground, but he doesn't know where his feet are, right? So that... There's a very easy example of proprioception. Yeah. yeah, please. You close your eyes, or you put your hand out. Close your eyes, put your finger out. Now put your finger on your nose and see if you know where your hand is while you're reaching for your nose. That's proprioception. You know where your hand is in yeah. relation to your nose, unless you're drunk. Yes. That's proprioception. Yeah, that's proprioceptive awareness, right? So proprioceptive awareness is a great example of what a consciousness which is not object-specific, right? Isn't the object your own world? Yeah, but it's not the real an object in the sense that I see this camera, right? So that's, I think, a really interesting example because it shows the, the fact that consciousness is really rooted in the body, right? And to explain it, we are going, not going to be able to use notion like object representation and so on, at least prima facie, right? Because the way my body is an object of my proprioceptive awareness is really different from the way in which this camera is an object of my uh, visual uh, cognition, right? And so if we want to use the, the notion of object, we will need to create a different understanding of what it means. And I think right now, nobody can really do that. All what we can do from the phenomenological side is point out to the fact that there is a sense of uh, awareness or consciousness which is not at least explicitly or specifically object directed which is nevertheless part of our experience and that's what we mean phenomenologists mean by phenomenal consciousness the how is it for me to experience whatever I am experiencing, and I think we can connect it with this notion of Alaya Vijnana as providing this uh, background of kind of very low level of subjectivity which get aroused by different objects, but remains nevertheless uh, all the time, right? That would be, for example, one difference between Alaya Vijnana and the idea of Bhavanga Chitta is that Bhavanga Chitta is a, um, oops, wrong, not wrong, ceases when uh, object-specific Vijnana are produced, right? So that 
would be one different, but I think they both point to an understanding of consciousness which is at a very low level and which is not object specific, right? And then out of this, uh, okay, we have a few more minutes, out of this uh, background of awareness, uh, comes out or pop out particular cognitive events which have a number of features that are described by the Abhidharma, I think, quite well and are really worth uh, keeping in mind. First is obviously Vedana, uh, feeling tone of experience, when we have this specific cognition, this specific cognition, which kind of arise out of this background of awareness, this specific cognition comes with a certain number of features. One is feeling tone, Vedana, and you all are strong meditators, so you know the centrality of Vedana in Buddhist ideas. It is the most important mental factors because it is the mental factors that conditions most, not all, but most many of our responses, right? If it's pleasant feeling tone, we are going to want more of it. If it's unpleasant, we are going to reject it and so on. And so, uh, uh, Vedana is, of, is, of, is extremely important. It's also interesting because if we think about consciousness from a biological perspective, uh, we have to realize that affective, that consciousness is not just cognitive, but it's also affective, right? Meaning how we feel about whatever we are experiencing and processing, right? And that's, for me, the big difference between a computer and uh, 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 a human mind, is that the human mind is a sentient mind, which means it has feelings. And by feelings, I don't mean woolly kind of emotion, like feeling good. No, I mean just the way we react to experience. It feels good, it doesn't feel good, it feels bad, it feels indifferent, right? that we have in all of our specific cognition, we have some kind of feeling tone. Now, the Abhidharma is going to say, Alaya Vijnana has a feeling tone. Well, this is where uh, maybe kind of systematization of Abhidharma goes too far, right? But clearly, in the specific cognitive event, most of the time we do have a feeling tone, and that feeling tone conditions Number one, why we have selected this particular input, right? Because we have many input, and sometimes the input is selected because if somebody shouts right, right next to your ear, you're going to turn, right? That's the object, strength of the object which makes you select the input. But often we select a particular input because of how they feel, right? For example, the uh, pop out of your name in, uh, in a party, right? is due to the fact that there is a particular uh, affectivity which is attached to your name, and so your attention is going to be drawn to that because of the feeling tone of the experience. So I think the Abhidharma is here quite interesting because I think it points to this, uh, to this understanding, or it's in sympathy with this understanding of consciousness as being biologically based rather than being purely cognitively based. So this is why I like Damasio, because I think many of his views are actually very uh, useful for Buddhists to think about consciousness, because affectivity is uh, a very important category, right? Much more than emotion. Affectivity is much more basic than emotions. We'll talk about emotions later, but affectivity is really where our kind of how we, how the world is for us takes shape, right? 
And then there is other mental factors, uh, samnya or sanya, which is a really difficult factor because it's a factor that makes distinction between object and so is this conceptual, is this non-conceptual, this is a whole can of worm that is uh, could be open but I'm not going to go there. Discernment uh, and the question is whether it's conceptual or not and this is all a bunch of difficult questions, right? For example, uh, discernment operates obviously at the linguistic level, no problem, but also at the perceptual level and so on. And so there are a bunch of questions. And there is chetana, which is intention, which is what I'm going to talk about next time because I think Buddhist has very interesting understanding of chetana, which is quite different from how the West has theorized intention. And then manasikara, which is attention, selection. So as you can see, when we look at these basic mental factors, according to the Abhidharma Samuchya, the, the Abhidharma looks pretty good, right? Looks like a pretty good phenomenology of mental events, right? Of cognitive events. Obviously, they're all kind of question. And then I left one, which is pasa, which is contact, which I think we don't need it. That's in here, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's in here, or maybe it's in here. I'm not sure exactly where it is. I don't, I'm not sure it belongs same as, at the same level as Vedana and Sanya. But anyway, this is just to give you a little taste. I mean, my topic of this courses were supposed to be Buddhist and consciousness, so this is, I think, what we can say. Okay, one more thing to say, because that's really important. One way that the Buddhists talk about uh, consciousness is as a flux or a stream of consciousness. Okay. And that view of the stream of consciousness is also in phenomenology. Husserl talks about the flux of consciousness. Uh, the term stream of consciousness is in William James, also this great American philosopher and psychologist. And so one of the questions that is raised by the notion of stream of consciousness is whether we are talking about discrete a digital stream or an analogical stream, meaning are we talking about a stream made of discrete moments or are we talking about something which is more continuous, right? You understand the question, right? And this is where the Hindu side is actually uh, has interesting views which we find also interestingly, in Husserl. And I think these views are really quite interesting. Husserl's view of time consciousness is that to understand consciousness, you cannot think of consciousness only as the impression of the present moment, but that you need to figure also what was immediately before and the way in which consciousness is expressed building expectation, making predictions about what is going to come immediately. That's what Husserl talk about time consciousness, and that's pure genius. That's also, you find it in Shaivite philosophy, in the Shaivite reputation of Buddhists, because the Buddhists, the Abhidharma, have this view of consciousness as being made of kind of, as being granular, as being atomistic. And the yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 the Abhidharma, sorry, the Abhidharma has this very same metaphor as William James, the stream of consciousness. Yes, but William James thinks the stream is more or less continuous. The Abhidharma thinks it is made by moments, right? But they still have to do Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but... Well, yes. yes, but they think that 
consciousness is made by discrete moment, right? Yes. And, yes. But when you have discrete moments, you're going to have a hard time uh, accounting for this synthesis between past, present, and future. And this is what the Shaivite were arguing against the Buddhist quite brilliantly. This is Ramakanta, uh, what's his name? The, the guy who is at Harvard who wrote this book, uh, Ramakanta. Uh, there, there is a really brilliant argument about that. This is just to indicate that we need to have a broad view and not just think that, yeah, everything that Buddhism is say is right, or this is the only thing. No. We are here to broaden our mind, at least according to my perspective, and understand, try to understand consciousness and using the resources of these different traditions. So, <laughs> example, because you always want me to give example, and you're right, example of time consciousness, consciousness of music, right? When you hear music, you're not hearing discrete notes, unless you're using like, I don't know, hyper-contemporary music in which nothing happens for five minutes and then there is <laughs> boing. <laughs> okay, that's not the kind of music I'm talking about. When you hear ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, you're not you hearing notes, you're hearing a, t a tune, right? And when you hear a tune, what is happening is that your consciousness is in some way kind of putting together what has already gone by immediately and well building expectation about what's going to come. And that's what Husserl talks about time consciousness. Consciousness requires synthesis of past, present, and future in order for it to be intentional meaning to make sense of the world. It's the same actually when you see a person walking. You're able to see a person walking only because you, the fact that that person was at a different place like a fraction of a second uh, ago is still in a certain way in your consciousness. And so consciousness is able to put together past, present, and future, right? Memory, present impression, expectations, predictions. So now we've, we realize, we've, we get uh, in a way, uh, uh, a way to understand consciousness as this way that our brain has to use memory in order to predict the immediate future, right? The memory we're talking about here is obviously ultra short-term memory, the one we were, you were talking in your talk and I was talking in my talk too, which is of the order, I don't know, of one second or something like that. The kind of memory that you have if you f have this thought. This class is really confusing. Now, this sentence has two parts, right? There is a subject, this class, and there is the, predi the pred uh, predicative is really confusing. When you are thinking is really confusing, you're not thinking this class, right? And yet your consciousness is able to kind of keep the two together, though in fact, in a way, every part of the sentence is, goes through your head at a different time, right? This, now, it's interesting if you notice the kind of internal dialogue that we have. Usually we skip the subject and we say, it really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the shortest way, right? But when you say this class really sucks, you have two parts. And when you think this class, you, this is the first part, really sucks. Second part, this class is already gone, and yet it's in your consciousness, right? That's a kind of consciousness that Husserl is talking about, and I think that opens real perspective to understand consciousness as a way in which our brain uses memory to make sense of what's going on and make prediction about the immediate future. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, you, you spoke about gestalt before, and it struck me in some ways that the present moment 
as we experience now is kind of experience against the background of the immediate past and the immediate future. Is, 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 would gestalt be a term used or that could be applied to the time process? No, not by Husserl. Not by Husserl. No. Uh, I, I don't think I would use the term background foreground to talk about the past. But, I mean, we could, I mean, let, let's be clear. What Husserl provides is a phenomenological analysis, right? He doesn't explain how this is done, right? Just what is the case is that to understand notes as a, as a, as a tune, we need to be able to synthesize present, past, and future. And that's what is required for consciousness, and so it looks like memory is going to be crucial to understand consciousness, and how the brain handles memory is going to be a really important part to, un to try to understand consciousness scientifically, whether we can or not, right? But this opens really interesting uh, perspectives. So, uh, obviously, the way Husserl understood his own project is much more ambitious, because he thought of it as kind of the foundation of all knowledge and science, but we don't need to think about that. And in fact, the whole contemporary interest in Husserl and Merleau-Ponty is based on taking the ideas and trying to understand them within the context of cognitive uh, science. Husserl based himself very much on Kant. I mean, this idea of synthesis is in Kant, right? But in Kant, this synthesis is done conceptually. What Husserl was able to argue is that the synthesis between the three times, this time consciousness, is not just a result of conceptualization, what Kant would call judgment, but, but is intrinsic to the experience itself, right? So. This is why, for example, we, we have all reason to assume that this is an experience widely shared among the, uh, across the animal kingdom, because there is no reason to think this is just a human way to process information, right? Okay. Uh, okay, any question? No, the Abhidharma doesn't do that. Uh, I guess, uh, first I would say, I didn't, I drew a kind of connection, I didn't equate the two, right? So one thing is important to make this clear. Second, I think that the way this is taken, for example, uh, well, in the Abhidharma Samuchaya, Alaya Vijnana is giving very precise characteristic, and indeed it appears to be something like below the level of consciousness. In the Nyingma tradition of uh, Tibetan Buddhists, they have a bit of more kind of broad, broader view of this category, and they use Alaya Vijnana and Rikpa as this kind of two alternative in which our baseline consciousness can be either really self-aware or not just self-aware and just providing this kind of uh, cognitive background. So I think the connection that I'm making is a bit stretching, but I don't think it's completely illegitimate if you look at various sources. But I would never claim that this is what the Abhidharma Samuchaya actually said, right? I think, okay. yeah. It's, it's an interpretation which I think can be reasonably defended, but as a kind of modern interpretation of an ancient concept. In the same way, I would not claim that my interpretation of Yogacara as phenomenological is actually what Yogacara thinkers had in mind, right? I think actually they, they were idealists, at least by Zabandu, uh, and I think that to me is pretty clear, but I think also as modern Buddhists, we should not just repeat what has been handed down, but trying to understand what the tradition means in terms that are uh, uh, congruence with our experience, right? Now, this is, has a certain amount of danger because sometimes you can go too far 
but I think uh, uh, we have to do that, and I think this kind of cognitive science offers for Buddhists a kind of rich avenue to understand their own tradition and to enter into this kind of dialogue. And for me, the word is dialogue rather than Buddhists telling people what consciousness really is. It's complicated, and there is uh, ample room for back and forth. That's my view, at least. Did any of the phenomenological writers emphasize affectivity or feeling tone, like Buddhism does, or in some way similar? Yes, but not in... I'm not sure. Yes, they do talk about affectivity, but I am not completely... I am not sure I understand really well uh, what they thought in particular. The emphasis on affectivity, I take it from Damasio, right? Who is this neuroscientist who has written many books, Descartes' error and, and so on. And I think I've always been interested between the, the understanding of Damasio's, uh, his understanding of consciousness and the, the closeness with the Buddhist idea of the primacy of affectivity. Here is where I, 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 I find it interesting, is when, when, from a Buddhist and from a phenomenological perspective, when, if you want this kind of background consciousness pops into cognitive events, right? People talk about, in, in cognitive science, talk in it about, uh, in terms of uh, cognition, right? But I think it's really, uh, it, we shouldn't talk only about cognition. We should also talk about affectivity, because how it is for me is not just the cognitive event, right? But it's also, and mostly, how it feels to me, right? And so this is a really important uh, characteristic that I always stress to my students, is that to understand consciousness, you have not just to think of it cognitively, but you have to think affectively as well. And I think the Buddhists uh, really uh, emphasize something which is actually missed, because think about the word cognitive science. No, it should be cognitive or affective science, because cognition and affect and affectivity are both two sides of consciousness, and they operate together. Now, in this model, what they will say is no. They will say, no, no, this is, this is all processing, when there is attention, then it's here, when we have thinking, that affectivity comes in. And I think if you do meditation and you do kind of contemplative phenomenology, you realize, no, this is not how it works. Uh, the affectivity happens right here, right? That is, we start to process effectively the various inputs that we get that are starting to enter consciousness really rather early, right? And so it's part of the experience itself, and I think Buddhism is bringing something that is re of real interest to the table, something that is not sufficiently emphasized by cognitive science. The very word is already a problem. Uh, what you're talking is a few people who are influenced by that way of thinking. They are mostly doing brain science yes. because the pe most people who are doing mostly cognitive science still think that computer models give you uh, a, a good grasp on, on cognition and consciousness. So maybe, maybe not. But I think they are, it's clear that there are two ways to think about consciousness here. And this second way, uh, is going to allow uh, affectivity to play a much larger role, and uh, this kind of model is going to emphasize the biological 
basis of consciousness versus this model, which tend to move toward what they call multiple realizability, right? The fact that consciousness could be realized not just in a human body, but in a computer, uh, in different mechanisms, and so on. This is why there is all this nonsense about downloading your brain onto a computer, uh, freezing your brain, uh, and all this kind of transhumanistic nonsense. Uh, which, to me, are based on this false view of consciousness as being purely computational. <coughs> We're just about done. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back to the historical thing I asked about earlier. Uh, did the Buddha pick or borrow his ideas of consciousness from the basic gestalt that was going on at that time in India? And two, did he have sort of a garden variety idea of consciousness, or did he have any inkling or any perception of what the topic would become? Or was he just using it in a broad, generic term? Uh, okay, I'm not going to answer this. Yeah. Uh, as you notice, yeah. No, I, this is something really, I, I don't think I have a, a, a good sense of meaning what is the understanding of consciousness in the early part of the, the sutta, right? There are some really interesting insights there, which I picked here and there, but I cannot say that I have really a comprehensive understanding of what the early sutta yeah, entails. And I think probably, I mean, what I expect is there is there are different understandings that are present, but I really would not want would not want to talk about that. This is why I take refuge in the Abhidharma, because in the Abhidharma there is a systematization that we can deal with. But you're right, there is a question of trying to understand what the early sutta were talking about in terms of the mental. And we have a specialist here, Alex Wine, and I have debate with him every time I meet him. So don't think that uh, what he's saying is necessarily true or false, but he's, <laughs> he's certainly really well informed about the early sutta, much more than I am. Done. So we're done with the 